Hello, my name is Patrice Lawrence and welcome to Bradford Literature Festival. I want to talk to you about my book, Eight Pieces of Silver, and some of the ingredients that went into making my book. Eight Pieces of Silver is about a girl called Bex. She's 15, she's black, she's working class, she's a lesbian, she's a Londoner, and even more importantly, she's a K-pop geek and really into Lord of the Rings. She has a cat called Azok the Defiler, as everybody should have. Her mum has just married Silver's dad. Silver is 18. Silver is very private, very quiet, and holds her own sadness. Silver has taken their parents to the airport to go at long last on their honeymoon, but she doesn't come back. Bex has to go into the forbidden territory of her sister's bedroom where she finds eight clues about Silver's disappearance. And I suppose it's a book about what happens when obsessional love meets obsessionally falling in love. But also, it's just like a standard mystery. So what goes into my characters? Because people often ask me, do you start with a plot or do you start with characters? I start with characters because I'm so nosy. I absolutely love asking other people about their life. I love collecting those little details that bring people together, then juggling them up and putting them on their page. But most importantly for me, so many of my characters go back to me. So let me tell you a little bit about some of those ingredients. So one of the first ingredients is family. If you read any of my books, you realise there are very few, I suppose what you would call standard families, though not many people I know live in standard families. But when you grow up, every book, when I was growing up, told me that a standard family was a husband, a wife and children, and they were always white as well. So I absorbed that for years and years because that isn't how I grew up. So these are some of my families. My mum is from Trinidad. She was the second youngest of 12 siblings. She was the only one who came to the uh, UK. And I am every Caribbean cliche in that both of my parents were nurses. So my mum came, I think, just because she thought Trinidad is too small for me. So do you know what? I'm going to go to Brighton in the 1970s, 1960s. So she came, she started studying to be a psychiatric nurse, and she met my biological dad. So my dad is called Patrick Edward Singh. He's part Indian and part African Guyanese. He was born at a time when there was a lot of stigma about being born out of wedlock, but also being part Indian and part um, African Guyanese. So his mum, who's the Indian side of his family, they moved to Barbados when he was about three and he was brought up there. And I've recently met a friend who knew him from his nursing days and says that my dad, Patrick, um, and his mate were sitting there reading a newspaper saying, oh, come to England and be a nurse. So he did. And that's where he met my mum. So imagine it. They both come from quite small Caribbean countries, quite religious countries. It's the 1960s, they're young, there's parties. Pregnant. I often say that uh, my mum became pregnant, but obviously she didn't manage that by herself. So my mum was pregnant, uh, my dad left her. So what do you do? You're black, you're pregnant, you're unmarried, you're in Brighton in the 1960s, you've got no family. So her choices were for me to be adopted, uh, for the pregnancy to be ended, Uh, or me to be sent to the uh, aunties in Trinidad. I would have had a wicked accent, but I'd be a totally different person. So I was fostered. So my first family was a white working class family in Brighton. And I was there from the age of four months to four years. And they were lovely. They nurtured me. They taught me how to read. They I was joined to the library as soon as possible. So books and stories have always been part of my life. But even when you're small and you can't quite articulate your difference, you can pick up on, I suppose, adult vibes. So you kind of know that you are different. I then went back to live with my mum. And it's a bit hard not living with your mum for the first four years. You don't necessarily have that closeness. So our closeness was through books. So my mum's a massive reader. So even now, if I go to a house and you open a cupboard, a book will fall on your head. Usually a recipe book from Italy or poetry. My mum loves poetry. So we connected. She would read books and then she would give them to me. Um, Little Women, Wind in the Willows. 
Ivanhoe. I couldn't really work with Ivanhoe. But so many other books, Anna Green Gables, all the books that are considered classics, they're fantastic. But again, there's no one like me in them. So when I went back to live with my mum, my mum had met my stepdad. So my stepdad has brought me up since I was four. My stepdad is Italian. He's uh, very short, and I think that is relevant, possibly. Um, he's a very fair-skinned Italian, so people talk about Mediterranean skin. That is not my stepdad at all. And he's always called me his daughter. So this is Patrice. This is my daughter. And as you see us as a family, people look at him. They look at mum. They look at me. They look at Angelo. And then I've got two younger brothers as well, who are Angelos. So we're all different colours. So I've always lived in families where we are all different colours. I've never lived with my biological dad. I've lived in, in a foster home. Um, my, my daughter is mixed heritage, as are my, uh, my brothers. So all of these going into my books, because families are messy. Families are different shapes. But also... When you have those experiences, you can put those little Easter eggs into your books. So other young people who have those experiences think, oh my gosh, I feel so seen. So for instance, people of mixed heritage often get asked about, are you Colombian? Are you Brazilian? And in my daughter's case, are you North Korean? I just thought, say yes. But I can take those jokes and put those in my books because I think uh, I want people to, to be seen. Um, secondly, in terms, of, I, in terms of class, my stepdad was a kitchen porter, and then a hospital porter, and then we had a fish and chip shop in Littlehampton for about 20 years. So again, I want to write about class as something that is slightly more fluid, because when you come from an immigrant family, the sort of the white working class that you learn about in sociology books doesn't quite fit your family. So I also want to write about class, but also very much about working classness. So Bex lives in social housing. She lives in a council block. And for me, that was really important. So again, for young people, if you are, if you are writing and creatively writing, draw from yourself, draw from the things that you know about. My next influence is names. When I'm stuck, I always use names and I use names to give me my backstory. So I'm Patrice because my father was called Patrick and he was born on St. Patrick's Day in Guyana. So there must be some Catholic stuff going on there. But I'm, I'm not christened, so it's kind of gone over my head. I lived in the only atheist Catholic family in West Sussex. Um, my stepdad is Angelo, but I recently learned when I was seriously an adult that his full name is Archangelo. Isn't that just wonderful? Because he isn't. Um, my mum is Veronica because my grandparents were, were Catholics and the priest named everybody after the saint's day they were born on, which pre-internet with 12 quids is like some going priest. So my mum is known as Veronica, but she was born on the same day as an older sister. So technically they have the same name because they're both named after the same saint. But in Trinidad, you're called something different to your, um, your sort of birth name. So my auntie baby is actually 90, but everybody in the Caribbean apparently has an uncle and auntie baby. So, for instance, when I was writing Indigo Donut, I thought, who is Indigo? Indigo is a colour of the rainbow. So what if she's got siblings who are called um, Scarlet, Coral, Primrose, Teal, Bluebell, Indigo and Violet? What if she'd never met her siblings? So that was my start of sort of Indigo. With eight pieces of silver, Bex is really called Rebecca after the flower because her mum said, well... A Rudbeckia is golden on the outside and brown on the inside, but you're brown on the outside and golden on the inside. So again, if you want to write, take the story of your name and then take another name, create a whole story around it and you'll create a um, backstory for a, a character. So the last thing I want to sort of you to think about, and again, what goes into eight pieces of silver is popular culture. And... I kind of get quite angry that people create hierarchies of culture, that you're supposed to like this up there and if you like that down there, there's something wrong with you. But actually, popular culture brings people together and Bex is a massive K-pop fan because K-pop brings people from across the world, uh, across the heritages, ethnicities, faiths, sexualities together to celebrate pop music. 
but also because in K-pop, like many things, the sort of boy bands are the ones that are like, oh, BTS, they're amazing, and they're good, but the girls do everything the boys do, except in high heels and hot pants. So I kind of wanted to celebrate the girls in there as well. I wanted to celebrate Lord of the Rings. Um, I also wanted to have a slight dig at uh, Orlando Bloom as Legolas, because if you looked at it as many times as I have, he spends his moment lots of times looking thoughtfully and into the distance, making ponderous statements. So again, bring all of those things in because they can add authenticity to your character. And the other thing, actually, on a slightly more serious note for me is about Korean drama. When I was writing Indigo Donut, um, I was really struggling. So my daughter said, Mum, on Christmas Day, I will cook you a Korean meal for Christmas dinner, but you will watch some K-drama. It's like, oh, no, no. Mum, you promised. Oh, it's going to be like watching EastEnders, but with, like, subtitles. Mum, you promised. Oh, OK, then. So we watched one. That was a three-parter. It was so good. For any K- uh, K-drama fans, it's called uh, Page Turner. And it's got, like, your high culture bit because it's got the um, list variation of Beethoven's Ode to Joy on piano. So, you know, you, could, you can use that to, like, lure people who are a bit snobby into that. But it's about young people. The voice is fantastic. The storyline is fantastic. And then I watched a few more with her because they draw you in. And she said, OK, Mum, you are now ready to watch Goblin. So Goblin is really preposterous when you explain it. It's about 16 parts. So you've got one guy, he's 923 years old. He doesn't look it. He was um, a warrior. He got betrayed. He got a sort of spear through his rib cage and it's enchanted. So he's looking to find his bride who will sort of take the spear out and he can finally die. And then there's Reaper. So Reaper is a Grim Reaper. There's a kind of gang of Grim Reapers in this particular part of uh, of Korea. Uh, They meet out in bars, have a chat. But when somebody's about to die, they put on a funky fedora and this very long coat and they follow the person. Then they take their soul to a tea room and that soul can drink uh, tea if they've been good and forget their past life so they can be born afresh. If not, they've got to remember every Grim detail until they're reborn. And some of those scenes are so sad and so touching. So there's one scene, for instance, where a man who is blind um, dies. And when he goes to the tea room, his old guide dog is waiting to lead him into into the um, afterlife. I cried so much, I lost my contact lens. Um, Everybody is remarkably good looking in these. But the most interesting thing is that Korean drama is sponsored. So body shop and mostly, very surreally, Subway sandwiches. So you get this moment of great emotional intensity. What's going to happen next? And then Reaper goes into his local Subway and orders his grilled vegetables, a spicy sauce and cheese sprinkled on the top. You're like, what? But because they're sponsored, every episode has to bring in viewers. Every viewer is supposed to stay not only for that episode, but for the next one, but um, for the whole 16 um, episodes. So every episode has got to have a story arc. It's got to have drama. It's got to have sadness. You've got to want to follow those characters. Every uh, series has got to have surprises. It's got to have twists in it, things that will take you somewhere. So actually... Do I think I want to write, like, Dickens? Like, no, I want to write, like, Korean drama. I want sadness. I want to make people cry. I want to have cliffhangers. And I want to have um, irrational product placement as well. So the last thing I want to do is just read you just a tiny bit from Eight Pieces of Silver. And the reason why is my final thing is voice. We are kind of taught throughout our lives, particularly if we're not white, middle class and uh, English particularly, that we might speak in the wrong way. And even though ours was an English speaking household, my mum is from Trinidad, my stepdad's Italian. So sometimes language gets used a bit differently. And you grow up thinking that's wrong, but no, we should embrace it. We should embrace all those little words. Embrace the moments when I yell at MasterChef because they're pronouncing Tali Tali wrong. Bring all that into your books. So Bex is, um, the eight pieces of silver is two first person uh, narratives. So I just want to read you a little bit to get a flavour of Bex. 
So this is from the very beginning. Bex, Mum said, fix up. Don't complain, just fix up. We've been clearing up after you for 15 years. That ain't strictly true. Well, for Mum it's true, but Justin's more recent. It's been seven years clearing up after me for him. Anyhow, I got home from school and found toast and marmite ba balanced on the edge of the table. The cornflakes box knocked over like the cereals trying to escape. Milk left out. It was like breakfast tried to commit suicide. I sent a message to Mum straight away. Silver didn't do the clearing up. She's in her room sulking. That's when Mum told me to fix up. When I replied, she said the plane's taking off and the steward's walking towards her with a look on his face. I know, Mum. She'll turn her phone off because she can never find flight mode and then shove it in a seat pocket in front. She won't turn it on again until her and Justin land in Japan. That's going to be more than 12 hours. I suppose I should leave them alone. It's the first few hours of their honeymoon, if it's still a honeymoon, when you're heading out nearly two months after you got married. But Silver, though, I was a witness standing right next to her when she promised our parents she'd make sure it's good while they're away. She even looked them in the eye when she promised. But what's she done instead? She's left dying breakfast all over the kitchen for me to find when I get home from school. I don't want her setting that as a mood for the next two weeks. Though thinking about it, even mush-up cornflakes and bad milk is better than some of the mood she's been cracking recently. Damn, it's going to be a long two weeks if Silver ke uh, keeps her sulk up all the time. So, thank you so much for listening. I hope... Um, I really hope that some of you watching this will want to write your own stories because we need different voices, we need different stories and we need your stories. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.